Hi, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for attending today's session. This is very close to my heart because, you know, when we consult with our patients and, you know, while we look at nutrition, we look at exercise, we look at sleep, I think one of our major pillars that controls all of the, the former that I just spoke about is your emotional wellness, okay? Uh, we choose what we eat depending on our emotions. It's as simple as that, you know, not many people when they're emotionally stressed will decide to eat an apple or, you know, munch on pumpkin seeds. It's usually the sugary foods that make us feel good because we're not feeling good. The sweeter foods that make us feel good because they're not feeling good. Uh, when our emotional wellness is not in place, it's the easiest thing to miss our workouts, you know, because we don't feel like you're feeling emotionally low. The last thing that you want to do is work out, even though that could be the best thing that you do, because when you work out, you'll actually start to feel better about yourself. And then sleep. If you're stressed out emotionally, you can't sleep at night. You can't sleep at night. You wake up tired. You wake up feeling non-productive, you eat the wrong food. So it's all interrelated. Now, I believe I've made a lot of points to talk today, and it's all in relation to the difficulty of letting go. It's not easy. The first thing that we need to do right now, I want everyone to close their eyes and just think of one or two or three things in your life that you're finding it really, really difficult to let go of. It could be some past it could be some past emotions. It could be you're dealing with grief. It could be anything. I just want this to be fresh in your mind. So while we're going through this masterclass today, you're able to relate to it. You know, letting go is not easy. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. It's not impossible. There are many things in life which are difficult, but we end up doing. Like a lot of people, they don't want to go to work, but they have to go to work for a livelihood. And you go. You may make 10 excuses, but you still go. So like that, letting go, you may make 10 excuses, but you still got to do it. Like how you go to work, you got to let go at some point for your own health. Letting go is not seen as a weakness. It in fact is seen as a complete strength. Because when you let go, I'm asking you to learn to let go intelligently. We do it with intelligence. Okay, we don't just let go of things which will make us feel like doormats. We don't just get let, let go of certain behaviors that will emotionally hurt us and change us and make us suffer or make lead us to disease. We're talking about the intelligent letting go system, how we do it with intelligence, how we do it with grace, how we stop swimming against resistance. So we talk about all of these things right now. Just take a minute, close your eyes and think what are those one or two or three things that come into your life right now into your mind that you're struggling to let go. Place that in your mind. Let's do that in about a minute or two. Go ahead. You can write it down if you want as well, or just think about it. I always prefer that you write it down. There's a, there's a lovely connection that happens when you have a thought and you connect a pen to that thought and a piece of paper. So you may want to write it down. Okay. <clears throat> so letting go is a gradual process. It involves a lot of strength and courage, which you may not have at that particular point. Maybe because you've been hurt. Maybe because you've lost someone you love. There could be several reasons. But the one thing that we need to know, that mastery of your world, I'm talking about your world, which is internal and around you. Mastery of your world is achieved by letting go of things which you cannot control. It is achieved by letting things take a natural course. Like in the field of medicine, in the field of integrated nutrition, sometimes no action is the best action because your body already knows what to do. There's nothing that we need to do. Like right now, all of you are probably in homeostasis. All of you, because you're breathing right. Your body does it on its own. The autonomic nervous system controls the pace at which you breathe, your pulse rate, all of these things, without you even knowing. You're not even thinking about, oh, do I, what pace is my heart beating? Should it be slower, should it be faster? Unless you have a symptom. All of this is happening with the intelligence of your own nervous system. It's flowing on its own. Now, the moment you try to interfere with the system, you move out of homeostasis. A lot of interference causes us to move out of homeostasis. Let me give you a simple example. If you're stressed out about a problem that concerns you, that's fine. But if you're stressed out about a problem that concerns someone else, that's not fine because that's not within your control. It's moving you out of homeostasis by changing your breathing because when we're stressed, our breathing becomes more and more shallow. The world is changing 
very, very fast in front of all our eyes, which is why slow down is like a personal luxury today. And everyone is trying to slow down. People want more holidays. Why? Because your life is moving too fast. About 10 years ago, a normal holiday was once in two years, once a year, because life had a different pace. You didn't have the requirement to cut away all the time. But today you have, because life is moving so fast. We all need that peace, that extra time off. Why? Because life is moving too fast. And I think control happens to be the highest virtue because everyone is trying to be in control some way or the other. If we're too busy comparing our lives with other people, now we're living in control because I have to be like that person. I need to buy what she has or he has. I need to look like that person. I need to look better than that person. All of this stems from control. The fear of losing your position. And that's a decent fear that we should have. We don't want to lose our position in a company. We don't want to lose our position in society. But when we start bringing on things in our life that we cannot control and we're trying to control them. Like if you are a particular skin color and you want to change it, can you? No. So how can that still, that still stress you out? If there are ways of changing that color, agree. Take the right actions. Remember, letting go doesn't mean you have to become a doormat. Letting go doesn't mean that, you know, I'm not going to do anything about it. If there are actions that you can take that will make you feel better, do it. If not, you're wasting so much of energy trying to control that. The same thing with a person. How can you ever control someone else's emotions? How can you control someone else's behavior? How can you control the tone of how someone speaks to you or the words that they use? Of course, you can communicate if you don't like the tone, you find it aggressive, you find it disrespectful, all of that you can do. But living in this, I wish he would talk better. I wish she would say this to me. I wish he would love me that way. I wish she would do this. You're just making your life more and more miserable. And then you talk to 10 people about your problems. And now you have 10 people talking about stuff that you cannot control. Why not take that energy and put it into what you can control? Like communication, taking the right action, all of these things. Letting go is a beautiful art that allows you to preserve energy. It allows you to flow with life. But why is letting go so difficult? We, we have over a thousand people who have registered for this event today. So there are a lot of people struggling with letting go. And like I said, most people, rich people, very, very rich people, some of my clients, they have a problem with letting go of a little bit of money because they have a different perception that I worked hard to get this. But we all assume that rich people should take their money and divide it and give it to everyone else. That's your perception. They have a different perception. They also have their own struggles of letting go. Whereas poor people sometimes have more generous hearts. People with less have more generous hearts. They share different perception. The whole point is letting go is difficult because we want to be in control. Whatever you are finding difficult to let go of is because you want to be in control. And that is the bitter, ugly truth. It doesn't make you a bad person. It's because you want to be in control. Every time your partner or your colleague or your boss or your friend or your siblings or your parents or, or whatever, they don't do something the way you want it to be done. They don't say something the way you want to hear it. You get angry because you want it your way. You want to control what everyone does and what everyone says. So letting go is difficult because you want to control things that you cannot control. Of course, in life, there are certain things that we have to control, like self-control. Try not to smoke. Try not to do things that will, you know, make your health bad. Self-control, necessary. Control of your emotions to build great companies, to manage your people better, to build respect. Self-control. Very, very important. The control that we're talking about is clearly, clearly the things that you cannot control. So by now, if you have those one or two or three things in your mind that you are finding, letting, uh, finding difficult to let go, each of those points of people, what is it that you are trying to control that is not controllable? That is what you have to ask yourself. And then the only solution is 
because you cannot control it, your only solution is to let go. Now you know that, but why is it difficult? Because of your ego and because of our pride. When you know you can't control something and you're still holding on, knowing that nothing can change it, like you're trying to control the past. What do we know about the past? It's gone. Nothing can ever change the past. Nothing. So when you know that, and yet it pulls you down, what is it that is holding you attached to that past? Hurt, pain, whatever it is. But is it serving you? Does the hurt that you're feeling, does the pain that you're feeling, can it change that situation? The answer is no. I'm not even going to give you an option to think about, yes, it can. It can't. It can't. In certain cases, someone may come and apologize to you after 10 years. They realize their mistake and they come and apologize to you. Maybe it can make you feel a little bit better, but it still doesn't change the past. We have to constantly remind ourselves. Anxiety is wanting to control the outcome. Your kids not come home from school on time. Okay, yes, you're worried, you're a mom, you're a dad, whatever, and stuff like that. But your anxiety is stemming from you want to be in control that my kid should come home right now. That's fine. That's fair. But remember, all kinds of anxiety come from a space of wanting to control the outcome. You have a deadline set by your boss. You're anxious. You want to control the outcome right now. You want to hit that deadline. You want to please your boss by hitting that deadline. You want to please yourself by hitting that deadline. So you're trying to control the outcome right now, which means you create your emotion right now before you've even reached that part. By doing that, you take your energy and focus off the process that can lead you to reaching that deadline. We're gonna talk about that a little bit later. So is it a weakness? Absolutely no. Letting go is a beautiful, graceful strength, which like I said, we do intelligently by asking the first question, can I control this? If yes, please go ahead and do whatever you can. If you can't control it, the point. You missed your flight. It's gone. There's nothing that can turn that flight around and come and pick you up, right? So you can shout, you can scream, you can abuse the airlines, you can abuse people, all of that stuff. Or you can put your energy into getting a new ticket, which makes more sense because that's uncontrollable. The flight's gone. You can make a complaint, X, Y, Z. You can try for a refund if it was not your fault, if it was the airline's fault, but you were late. There was traffic. We couldn't reach the airport. Who do you blame? Then you want to project your anger and your feeling. It's, it's got to be projected somewhere, right? Projection is onto something or onto someone. So it'll either be the traffic, it'll either be all the traffic, it'll either be, either be the airline that wasn't sensitive to hold the flight for you or whatever it is. But in that step, if you would just let go, I did it. Next time I'll leave two hours earlier. Next time I'll do this. Next time I'll do that. But you've held your power. You've held on to your inner power and your inner peace. Now, if someone harms you in life, am I asking you to let go? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Women and men have to learn how to stand up for what is right at all given points. But is the right way of doing that. You don't have to become a doormat. You can communicate. Most men and women are afraid to communicate because they don't want to be judged. They're too scared that they may lose what they have. They come from areas of low self-esteem and low self-worth. All of these things go in defining your reaction to a situation. Some people will use anger. Some people use righteous anger. What is righteous anger? Okay, let's say you're a guy and you see these small uh, kids being abused by a guy. Okay, he's touching them inappropriately or whatever and stuff like that. Okay, are you going to go and preach the word of God to him or something like that? No, you wouldn't. You would go and you would do what you have to do. And if that person retaliates, you would retaliate as well. Righteous anger done with the right intention is not bad at all. Anger, which is projected from a space of insecurity, shortcomings, fears, all of that is wrong anger. It's a depleting anger. Letting go comes with strength. 
the first step now of those three points that you have, by now you would have figured out what is controllable and what is not controllable. If there is something that is not controllable, the only thing that you can do is let go. Let it pain. Go through the pain. That's okay. Sometimes you got to go through that emotion. You got to ride it out completely so it doesn't keep coming up. But every time you get pain and uh, you smoke a cigarette, okay, what happens when the cigarette's over and the pain comes up the next time? You smoke another and another or you have another shot of alcohol and that's how addiction grows because you're trying to cover up a negative emotion. Every negative emotion has to be faced. If you suppress it, you could do a damn good job at suppressing it. It may not come up today. I know clients and patients where it's come up after 30 years, after 40 years. I can tell you one thing in life for sure, what you suppress has to come up at some point in your life. It may come out in anger. It may come out, come out in a nervous breakdown. It may come out in an outburst. And sadly, like we're seeing today, it may come out in diseases like cancer. So the whole point is, how do we grant ourselves and other people around us a space to naturally evolve? You have a partner in your life. You want to change that partner. You see them doing the wrong things with their health and whatever. And you are coming from a space of care. You don't like to see your partner do that because you care about their health. But every time you start talking about that to them, you're met with resistance. You're met with accept me who I am how I am, all of that stuff. There's only one thing that you need to do. Allow them their space to evolve naturally because you cannot control that anymore. You can help once, you can help twice. After that, you need to grant that space to other people to evolve naturally. Do you like being controlled? Each and every one of you, ask yourself this question right now. Do you like yourself being controlled by your boss, by your partner, by your parents, by your kids, or whatever. Do you like that? The answer is going to be no. And if you don't like being controlled, why does it make it so easy for you to want to control others or control others? You don't like to be controlled by situations, but yet you want to control situations. You see, when we maintain the cycle, okay, it's very difficult to move out of it. You have to break the cycle, like forgiveness. If you've been forgiven 10 times, you go out there and you forgive 10 times. There's no difference. It doesn't matter what it is. It's as simple as that. So when people say, come, Luke, teach me forgiveness, all of that. Before I would do a meditation, I would do all of it. Ask them one question. How many instances in your life have you been forgiven for? They say one, two, three, four, five. What gives you the right not to forgive someone else? Why are you different? Why do you feel entitled? So sometimes you can go into the depths of forgiveness. And I also feel sometimes going into deep moves us away from simplicity. If you've been forgiven, you pass that on. You pay that forward to someone else. You've been forgiven. You forgive someone else. It's the same thing with allowing other people to evolve. Today, a lot of parents want to control how their children evolve. There are many things you can control. Of course, you've got to discipline your kids, teach them because they don't have the maturity level. Yet, yeah, you've got to nurture them, but you can't control every aspect of them you got to naturally allow them to evolve. you got to naturally allow your teenagers to evolve. Of course, you can put your foot down when you have to, and you got to do that. You also don't want to be that weak parent that just gives in because you want your kid to say, I love you every day and all of that stuff. No, you got to know when to put your foot down and control the things that are within your power and when to back off because it is not in your power. Because it's not in your power. So you can't control those things. I counsel parents where the mother has a problem because the kid says, I love my father more than you. This is a nine-year-old kid. And now the mother is, but I, I gave birth. You don't know the pain I went through and all of that stuff and whatever. I'm trying to emotionally control a kid. Kids are innocent. And then when you break it down, I, and I ask this specifically, well, so yeah, because you know he take, my husband just comes home and takes the kid out and they go for drives and all of that stuff. I said, what if you do that? What if you start doing that? Because that's what the kid likes, right? It's not a competition. But she has such a difficult problem letting go of the fact that her kid says she, she loves the, the, the father more. Is that controllable? No, it isn't. It isn't. It's ego and pride. So letting go comes in our way. You know, Letting go allows 
nature to do its own work in the most beautiful way. I mean, let me give you an example. You plant a seed, you can water it, you can put fertilizers, you can expose it to sunlight. After that, you back out. You let nature do its work. You don't try to micromanage its growth. You don't try to do anything like that. It grows without you intervening because nature has to follow its own course. Today, people want to control everything. They want to control people. They want to control their future. Most people stress the want to control the future, which is not even promised. Your next hour isn't promised to you. What does that teach us? Put all your energy into the present moment. People want to control their partners. The need of that control gives you a sense of power. I'm in control. That's the ego and pride. I'd like to be in control of many, many things. But is it coming from a space of ego and pride? That's bad for you. If it's coming from a space of intention, yes, I want to be control, in control of the kind of food I store in my fridge. I want to be in control of the kind of quality of nuts I buy from the grocery store. That's fine. Intention. But you can't be in control from a space of ego. So what happens is we can't control everything and many things start to fall into place when you stop controlling them. How many of you have experienced that? You finally just let go and the relationship, relationship starts to get better. All of a sudden you stop telling your partner, like you go, you, you, you've been nagging him every day, stop smoking, stop smoking, stop smoking. Stop. And then you back off and after a while, he stops smoking or she stops smoking. That's the beauty of nature. It has its own course. It doesn't work according to your timetable. None of us work according to anyone's timetable. We create our own timetables and that's why we want to hold on to it. But the day throws you several other things that come your way and all of a sudden you feel you're you know, out of control. Because that little paper that you made in the morning of your to-do list and I'll work out at this time, I'll do yoga at this time, I'll do it. It got derailed because an emergency came up. Let go. Controllable, non-controllable. You have a friend calling you up during your work day. Do you have to answer the call? You have someone who is emotionally pouring out onto you, but you're not emotionally available, but you're still listening because you want to be the good person. Instead of politely telling the person, I'm not emotionally available for you right now. Can't do it. So letting go involves all of these things. When you learn to let go, you give space to the universe to unfold in a way that is right for you. How many of you have wanted things in life? You got some of them. You didn't get some of them. And today, when you look back, you're so happy that you didn't get them. What was that? You had a desire. You had a want. But today, you're happy like, oh, I'm so happy that didn't happen. That was the universe unfolding at its own pace, giving you what is right for you at the right time. But when we're in control, we want everything. Classic example, lottery, lottery ticket winners. Such beautiful, beautiful research done on the top people who win jackpots of millions and millions and millions of dollars. Most of them go bankrupt within a year or two. Most of them. A force comes into your life when you're not ready for it and it's taken away. The whole point of control, letting go makes, there's a big difference between controlling and allowing, okay? A big thing, I can control my emotions, suppress it, or I can allow my emotions to be communicated. There's a very, very big difference between that. So what are the things that we can do to make it easier for us to let go? Number one, change, embrace change. Will feelings change? Of course. Of course, but the degree of the feeling doesn't have to. Intensities may change. Energies, can energies change? Of course they can change. Right now we're talking nicely. Right now if I start using abusive language, the energy changes. We can change energy with our words, with our tone. The point is, change is always going to happen. If you live in your own bubble that I'm so comfortable, I don't want anything to change, resistance. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. Newton's law of gravity, you throw an apple up, it's going to fall down again. No one can ever change that. So you don't even try to change it. But when you know that change is always going to happen, you can see that from a young born, 
are they same when they're one year old and three year old and five years and nine and then 15 and then 18 and then 22 and then 30 and 50 and 60 and 90? Everyone's different. Show me one person. You have the wannabes who, who will try to be, you know, they'll want to try to be their 20 when they're 40 and, you know, they have to go through so much of energy to try to maintain a facade because they're against nature. And then there are beautiful people who gracefully age. They accept the little white hair coming up, the little wrinkle in the skin. They accept it gracefully and they're happier people. So the point is, get this into your head. Change is going to happen at every point in your life. Nothing is permanent. Nothing is permanent. We would like to think that certain things are permanent, but it isn't. It isn't. And when you remind yourself of these hard facts in life that everyone around you is going to die, including yourself, the idea is not to look at it from a pessimistic angle. The idea is, what can I do knowing that my loved one may die? You know, anyone can be taken out of my life at this point. I may not live. So it teaches me, if I'm not going to be there, how can I protect my loved ones? How can I make sure that they have a beautiful life, even if, if I die or whatever, something tomorrow? So it moves you into action. But now, if you don't take that action, oh, no, I can die anytime. I'm living in fear, anxiety. How is it serving you? In fact, you're actually manifesting what you don't want. If you know your loved ones are going to die at some point, your parents, what are you doing? Are you spending more time with them? Are you forgiving where forgiveness is necessary? Are you trying to make them happy? Are you living that life so that you don't have to have regrets of not doing things or loving the way you're supposed to? This is what we have to learn from change. It's always going to happen. Your child is going to change. The biggest issues that I have with a lot of parents is, oh, you know, we gave our children so much of love and today a teenager and my son's doing joints. Oh, look, we didn't raise him that way. Yeah, you did your best as a parent. Okay, today he's smoking a joint. Let go. You can tell him once, you can tell him twice. After that, you gotta back off. You gotta back off. You can't hire me to get your son to stop smoking. I can speak to him, but then he has to choose his own path. The whole point is parents are trying to control that. And then all of a sudden, they start using the emotional card. I did so much for you. And this is what you do. And the kid is like, what's wrong with my parents? It's just a joint. I just went drinking out with my friends last night. I love my parents. Why are they using this emotional thing against me? And that's where that distance between the teenager and the parents, the mistrust and the loss of confidence starts to happen. And now your kid's going to hide behind your back and do more and do everything. It was only a joint. It was only a cup of alcohol. Are you perfect? Go back to your teenage years. Maybe you did it. Maybe you didn't. But... He's not you and you're not him. Get that straight. So the whole point is you're trying to control something. Now, what you can do is, if you know, like I have a daughter, she's eight years old right now. Since the time she's four, I've been educating her on drugs. I've been educating her on good touch, bad, whatever I feel she should know right now in her subconscious mind. Now, whether she smokes a joint or whether she does whatever and stuff like that, I know she'll do it with awareness and I'm okay with that. I'm absolutely okay with that because it's not within my control. But what is in my control is the kind of education I can give her, the kind of real life examples, constantly talking about these things, relating it with real life, you know, understand. That's in my control. What she does when she steps out of home is not within my control. So I'll sleep at night when she goes out. The point is coming back to change. There are going to be ups and downs. There's going to be yin and yang. There's going to be darkness. There's going to be light. There's going to be day. There's going to be night. Nature. This is not my rule. This is nature's rule. And that's going to happen in your life. So if you just think today, I reached that perfect point. I got a good salary. I got a good husband or wife. I have a great sex life. I got this. And now I'm just going to be happy. And you think that it's going to be that way. You can intend for it. And then the moment the first struggle hits you, everything collapses. Everything collapses because you've not reminded yourself that that's what life is. There's going to be ups and downs. The person you love the most will have the ability to hurt you the most because you love him the most or you love her the most. Have you ever figured out that possibility? And then people say, how could she do this? How could he say that? The deeper the love, the deeper the hurt. The deeper the love, the deeper the pain. But that's also what makes love beautiful. 
But then when you try to control the things in love or in health, let's talk about a person trying to lose weight. You're trying to control the outcome all the time. When you know that your body is going to change, maybe post a pregnancy for a man, as you lose muscle mass or metabolism after the age of 40 or 45, you know, but you're still trying to resist it. For that, there's a whole market out there that tries to tell you, yeah, you can do it, you can do it. Take this pill, take this protein. You can't defy aging. If you're gonna lose muscle mass, that is the metabolism of the body, it is gonna happen. When menopause happens, your body's gonna change. Your hormones are gonna fluctuate. You're not gonna look or feel 20 when you're 60. You can in your mind. So accept it. I have women today who before deciding to get pregnant will take a consult with me and say, Luke, I'm going to get pregnant, but will you guarantee and help me to get my body back into a shape after that? And at that point in my mind, the only thing I want to tell them is you're not mature to even talk about pregnancy. You're not mature to even bring a child into this world with that kind of thinking. Your body is going to change. Yes, you can come back. Yes, you can come back. I have women who are opting for C-sections because they don't want uh, uh, I'm sorry, they're opting for, they want a normal delivery because they don't want a C-section. And they have so much of stress that at the end, everything's moving towards a normal delivery. And all of a sudden, like it happens in medical cases, the doctor switched to a C-section. And the woman at that point is, what about the stretch marks? What about the stitches? What about the pouch that I'm going to have? Even at that point, so much of anxiety because they're not willing to flow. This is nature. This is what is happening. So, so much of anxiety trying to build control around something that you cannot control. So change is always going to happen. Picture yourself in a river. Okay, you're flowing down the river and you grab onto a rock or you grab onto, you know, uh, the side of the river. Okay. It's moving you, but you're holding on. You're holding on, holding on, holding on out of fear. Where's the river going to take me? What's going to happen? And you keep holding on. Now, you've limited all of your possibilities of where the river might take you. Maybe just two feet further, you'll arrive at the bank of the river where you'll be safe. Maybe not. But by holding on to that, you're draining more and more energy. Finally, you're going to have to break loose because your arms are going to hurt. But what you've done is held on instead of letting go because you don't trust life. You don't trust the universe. You can't see that there are possibilities when you let go. You want to control your position holding on to that rock. That's the only position you want to control. So it doesn't allow you to think that I'm going to get tired and eventually leave. What if I leave right now and flow? Maybe there's another rock I can hang on to. Or maybe I'll be safe. And that's what risk is. Okay? It's always going to be risk in your life. How much of risk you take? Again, is your capacity to learn to let go. Very, very important. Today, too many people in life are swimming against the tide all the time. Instead of flowing with the tide, they're swimming against the tide. Look at surfers. Look at sailors. Everything is planned according to the tide. You only go against the tide when there are some dangers. Like in a ship, you've got to move. You go against the tide. For that, you change your action plans. There are certain engines that fire up. There's a certain amount of water that you've got to release. All of that stuff. You're prepared. Sometimes in life, we have to go against the tide. It's not always going to be with the flow. You're going to have to swim against the tide. But situations that you can have control, not situations that you can't control. Today, most people are swimming against the tide and they are tired. They're swimming against the tide in their relationships, with their health, in their personal growth, and they're burning out. Because if it's something that you can control, you will eventually reach there. If not, you're just swimming, you're just swimming, and you're just swimming. So when you exercise a constant resistance, you block the energies of the universe. You don't allow nature to fall, unfold the way it's supposed to. You're constantly resisting nature. There is nature in every human being. There is nature in every single human being. Now let's talk about society today defines how people have to be. You've got to dress this way, look this way. If you're at this party, you've got to do this, you've got to do that, and all of that stuff. Now, what if that's not your inherent nature, but you're constantly having to do it to be accepted? You're swimming against the tide. 
And then you don't like it. You're burning out. You're like, oh no, another weekend. I have to go and blow dry my hair because the straight look is in and this and that and whatever. If you like straight hair, go and do it because you like it, but not because society defines it. So you see, again, we're living in society with resistance, with so much of resistance of having to be a particular way. So letting go allows you to decide where you want to be, with whom you want to be, how much of time you want to spend, what time you want to have your meals, what time you want to, based on you, your spirit, what you like, what you want to do. So embracing change, extremely important for you to remind yourself that everyone is going to change. Now, how can I put energy into facilitating it the right way? So a lot of people say, oh, the first year of my marriage was all great. And then the second and the third and the fourth and the fifth. What were you doing in the first year of your marriage that made it so great? It's easy to blame your partner. Are you doing the same things that you did with your partner in the first year? In the second year? If the answer is no, why have you stopped doing them as well? You can come up with 10 flaws in your partner. But what about you? And then you wonder why things have changed. Anything that's changed in your life today that you don't like, you've played a role in it. Remember that. Either you've changed or the other person's not changed or the other person's changed and you haven't changed. You can't say, I'm going to be this person always. It's impossible because your biology is changing. Your chemistry is changing. Your physiology is changing. Your brain cells are changing. If that's changing, you, you're resisting again. I don't want to change. It's like people with a medicine. Oh, their whole life, I, don't, I look down on allopathy. I look down on Ayurveda. I look down on that. That's fine. But when the time comes that you may have to take it, you got to break that resistance or that medicine's not going to work on you. you got to break that resistance, which is why I tell people, don't get into extremes. Don't say, this is the best for me. This is the best definition of love. This is the best way to lose weight. It may be today, but 10 years later, when you're valid battling your hormones, you may need another approach to lose weight. You can't say it worked for me then. Why isn't it working for me now? What's going on? Change is always happening. I want to talk to you now about usefulness and uselessness. Very important when it comes to letting go. You got to learn how to let go of things that are useless in a situation and adopt what can be useful in that situation. Let me explain this with an example. It's pretty tricky. Uh, in New York, if you're living in Manhattan, you don't have to own a car. You don't have to. Number one, parking is a problem. Number two, it's crowded. And number three, transport is excellent. Rich billionaires use public transport. But now, let's say you're living in Virginia, the outbacks, you know, uh, where there's a lot of uh, uh, farmland and stuff like that. You'll probably need a car because you've got to travel, travel 20 kilometers to buy stuff and buy goods and stuff like that. So let go of things which are useless in a particular situation. Like, for example, okay? You want to buy stuff right now, which you don't need in the situation you are right now. And by buying that stuff, there's going to be stress of number one, buying it and then keeping it and stuff like that. So the whole point of also letting go is learning uselessness and usefulness. Where do you adopt usefulness in your life? And where do you get rid of uselessness? If you're in an argument with your boss or your partner and stuff like that, do you think it makes sense to talk about things which are useless? Like just imagine you're constantly bringing up the past. It's useless. Your partner can't change the past. You can't change the past. So how does this conversation contribute towards the conversation or the fight that you're having? But you can adopt usefulness in that conversation by letting go of the uselessness that is not serving the past. You're talking to your kid. I don't like you drinking Coca-Cola. Look, you saw that kid, the next door neighbor, he doesn't drink Coca-Cola and look at him. He looks so good. His skin is so clear. Useless. You talk about the usefulness. The Coca-Cola is bad because it will affect you X, Y, Z. It is useless to bring the other subject in, which now brings a whole load of emotion. So usefulness and uselessness are two very, very important factors of letting go of things you cannot control. You're bringing in things that you cannot control into a conversation, into your thoughts, into your relationships, into your work. Oh, when I worked 20 years ago, this worked. This is 20 years later. It doesn't have to. It was useful back then. 
it's useless right now. But then the ego comes in. But it worked for me. I did this. I did that. Ego and pride. So what are some of the useless things that you still have in your life that you no longer need to use anymore as a tool? And how can you replace it with something that is useful to fix the problems that you may have in your life, to fix your health, to fix your relationships or whatever else it is? The third point, learning not to focus on the outcome. How many of you think you really have control over the outcome of what you're doing? I'm working hard today with a vision and a dream, but it doesn't mean the outcome has to be the way I want it. Maybe it can be greater than the vision and dream I have. Maybe it won't be, maybe it won't happen. But I can't say now, oh, what if it doesn't happen? It's okay, let me just stop working or cut down and become slack. You can't control the outcome of anything. I know people who have spent lakhs and lakhs of money on education to put their kids in IIT and all of that stuff and become engineers and doctors. And those same kids today are working in coffee plantations, following their passions and their dreams and all of that stuff. You could do the best for your kid, but you can't control the outcome. And then there comes the mom and the dad, you know, Luke, we worked our life. We saved our money. We didn't party. We didn't buy clothes. And we put that money into our child's education. And today he's gone and become a farmer. And I say, so what? So what? Why would, what outcome were you thinking you could control? And then we have the weaker people who, because they don't want to displease their parents, will do what their parents say. They will become engineers. They will become doctors. And that's okay. Because maybe you love your parents and you don't want to see them hurt and all of that stuff. But now you're unhappy. You're going to work every day and doing a job that you don't like. And now that's affecting your health. It's affecting you emotionally. It's affecting you at every angle because you've gone against nature of what you really want to do. You've interfered with a process, which is nature. I want to do this, but I have to do this. So the whole point is to learn to stop focusing on the outcomes. How many people focusing on the future today that they've even forgotten how to be in the present? Have people saying, look, I need this in the future, this, 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 this. So I say, what are you doing in the present? Oh yeah, I still have to start. How are you going to get your future when you haven't even started doing the work in the present? Because they're constantly thinking about the future. Constantly. I wrote down this one line that I want to read to you. Focusing too much on the future makes you anxious. Obviously, it's going to make you anxious because you can't control it. Anything that you can't control makes you more and more anxious. You cannot control whether the person who loves you in your life is going to be there tomorrow, day after, after one year, two years, three years. They can be taken away from you in any way. They can die. They can move on. They can get sick. They can find someone else. Not in our control. But what's in your control is the journey between now and the outcome. How do you make the most of it? So many people are so stuck in trying to control the future of love, relationships, health, money, that. The present is just passing them by and they're not planting enough of seeds to give them that kind of outcome that they're now locked in. That outcome has become their prison cell. So our present endeavors, are, they become fueled by our desire to control uncontrollable results. I'm only going to do this if this happens. So people come to me, Luke, you know, I'm going to pay you money. I'm going to do this, 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 but I want this. I, says, I can't guarantee you anything, but what I can ask you, are you willing to do this, 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 and this? And that's the start. I can't tell you what the outcome is going to be. Your oncologist can't tell you what the outcome of the chemotherapy is going to be. No one can give you an outcome at all. No one. No one can give you an outcome of that. But by letting go of your control of the outcome, you now focus on the present, the journey of what you're doing. You commit to the process. Always use this example. Okay? You have a dream and the outcome. Okay, I have a dream and this is how I want it to be. In between the dream and the outcome is a process. Your only job is to commit to the process and hold on to the dream. The outcome will happen when it's meant to happen, depending on how you've committed to the process. So people are, Luke, I need 10 kilos lost. I said, give me one day of following what I'm telling you to do. Then give me the second, then give me the third, then give me the fourth. You just commit to that. Because I can't tell you whether you lose 10 or 12 or 5 or 2. I can't tell you that. 
I don't have the expertise. I don't have the intuition to tell you that. No one has that, right? Commit to the process. Let the outcome go. When you constantly focus on the outcome, you lose control of the present. You're miserable. You're chasing something that you cannot see, that you cannot control. And then you start getting greedy and impatient. And these are qualities that take you away from the present moment and your commitment towards that process. An archer loses his ability to shoot when he's only focusing on the prize. An archer will only focus on the target. You keep your eyes on the target, that's all you got to do. You may get the prize, you may not. But when your focus is on the prize, you lose focus of the target. It's in every aspect of your life. Half the relationships today are dying. Why? Because one or both partners are focusing on everything outside of their relationship. How other relationships are working. Which wife gave a five-carat diamond to, you know, which husband gave a five-carat diamond to the other wife? Who did this? Who did that? What are you doing? How are you staying in your lane? The problem is everyone wants to be in everyone else's lanes today. They're so worried about what's happening. They don't look at what they should be doing in their own relationship, in their own business, with their own health. So many people, Luke, my friend lost weight. You know, he did this cleanse and this happened. I have one question for him. What have you been doing? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I need to start. Yeah, I'll be joining you soon. So you see, you're trying to control outcomes through comparison. Your eyes, your mind is not on the target that you want to achieve. So letting go is a state of flow. Now we come directly into some of the possible things that you're thinking. Look, I can't let go of that. The, the words my partner used against me. Look, I can't let go of my childhood. My father said this. My mother told me that, you know, I was an unwanted child, but you just happened and stuff. Difficult stuff to handle. Of course, we all want to feel wanted. We all want all of that stuff. But you can't change what has been said. You don't ever want to talk to your parents again? Don't talk to them. That's fine. But you can't want to talk to them and not forgive them and still struggle. Somewhere you have to let go. You have to let go. It's not because I'm telling you to. It's because you don't have a choice. You have the choice of continuing to live in misery. Or you have the choice to go through that pain and let go once and for all. Once and for all. And you go through life. You would have just let go of the bad things that your parents said. And tomorrow you're at a party where someone is talking about how beautiful their parents were and the kind things they said. And that past will come up again, but it'll be easier for you to handle. It won't go away completely. You have to let go so that you lighten up. You got to let go of emotional baggage so that you don't have to carry a weight anymore. You can't punish other people in the past. You can't do that. You can take an action at that point. You can't do it right now. You can't say that, oh, you did this to me 10 years ago. You did this in the company and that's why the company didn't go, grow. We have to take responsibility for who we are. I can't let go. I've been dealing with a mother who can't let go of the death of her young four-year-old daughter. Many, 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 many cases. What do I tell this particular person? I can't just tell her, let go. How can I? I wouldn't be able to do that. You've got to create new experiences for the mother, new focus points, the four years of life, everything else. You have another sibling, you have another child now, focus all your love on that child. You've got to ease them into that whole process. But for all the little things that we know we should be letting go, please let go of it as quickly as possible. Knowing that things change, people change. If you've got into a relationship thinking your partner is never, ever going to change, Okay, you're going in with a wrong expectation. You're lucky if they don't, but if they do, are you willing to go through that change? Are you willing to change as well? Are you willing to change your levels of maturity and understanding? Are you willing to evolve as your partner evolves? In companies, are you willing to evolve as the company evolves? Are you willing to evolve as your teams around you and your team members evolve? These are all questions that you have to ask yourself because things are going to change. So today, the only way forward, like we all know, is the present. You're either giving too much of your energy, your headspace and your heart space to your past or to your future, which is why you're feeling miserable in the present. You have only so much of energy. Half of it's in the future, half of it's in the past. What do you have left for you? 
a couple of cups of coffee and caffeine to get you through the day. No, you've got to be wake up, not waking up in the morning with loads and loads of energy to make today beautiful. We have a beautiful line in many religions. It's, it's in Islam, it's in the Bible, I'm sure it's in the Vedas as well, about talking about the importance of living one day at a time. That's what makes us happy. You are one great day, just be grateful for one great day. And you will attract another great day and maybe you'll have a bad day the next day. But you still remember the two good days that you had. And what does that show you? It's possible to have good days as well. And it's also possible to have bad days. It's not going to be permanent. Every phase in your life has to end. I don't know a single person who's been angry all the time, jealous all the time, sad all the time, happy all the time. Do you know anyone? No, right? Phases. Phases, phases. And you have, the, you have people who pretend to be happy all the time. Some people who are sad all the time because they're addicted to sadness. It puts them in a victim mode where they get sympathy. And now they've gotten used to sympathy that they don't want to make a change, unconsciously or consciously. You can even get addicted to negative emotions. That's why I keep telling people, never nurture a negative emotion. Nurture a positive emotion because you can get addicted to that. And you do want to get addicted. But if you nurture a negative emotion, you can become addicted to it because you don't have control over your subconscious mind. Your subconscious mind doesn't know the difference between a lie and a truth, between virtual and reality. It takes and it performs its function. That is why it is so important for us to understand if you are hanging on to something in the past that causes you suffering, every time you think about it, you have suffering. It's as simple as that. At some point, your exercise for today, your homework for today and the week is what are those little things that you are struggling to let go of? Write them down. At the side of each of them, out of this, what is controllable? What is uncontrollable? Whatever is controllable, what action points can you take? Write it down. I can speak to this person. I can do this. I can walk out. I can change my job. Those are controllable. In the uncontrollable, you have to let that go. You don't need counseling for that. You don't need motivation for that. You don't need inspiration for that. You just got to let it go. Like I said, there are some things in life that you just do. You just do it. You wake up in the morning and you brush your teeth. You just do it. So it shows that you have the possibility to just do things. And the uncontrollables is something that you got to do. Ask yourself, is it serving me? Can it be changed? If the answers are no, you have to let go of it. And then some people are, but Luke, I, I, I really love that person. Great. Great you did. We understand. But you're miserable right now. So whether that person loved you or whatever, whatever, you're miserable now. How about letting go and then feeling that love of that person because you've been able to let go of the emotion that comes with it. Letting go is an art and I can tell you it is one thing that people have to learn to do. Acceptance and letting go. Letting go of things that you cannot control is a strength. You need a lot of strength because you're battling the ego. You're battling the pride. That's why I say it's a strength and the way it will lighten you up. You know, sometimes when a lot of people have been hurt, I tell my clients, write a letter to that person. You can send it to them or an email or you can just tear it up. But today I let go of you. You did this, this, this. It made me feel this way, this way, this way for the longest time, but enough is enough. It's my life now, and I am letting you go in the most politest and kind. By doing that, will give you so much of freedom and so much of lightness in your heart. If you can't give it to the person, tear it up, but do it. Maybe you'll have to do it once or twice or thrice, but that is a way of letting go. So the Chinese, they like fire lamps and they let them go in the sky. They do it in Thailand as well. They're letting go of unhappiness. They're letting go of all of these things. Different civilizations have ways of letting go. Some people do it through smoke. They light fires. There are dances and rituals. And as the smoke is moving up, the guilt is moving away. The negativity is moving away. These are rituals which have existed for decades and decades in civilization. Because everyone knows, even back then, what you hold on now becomes your weight in your heart, in your mind. And... For a lot of women and men who struggle with weight loss, they are holding on to weight, weight of emotions, weight of the past, weight of negativity, weight of insecurity, weight of uh, 
all of these negative things. And unless you first let go in your mind, I have seen it time and time again, how weight starts, their, 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 their waist start to actually shrink, burning off fat. Sometimes it always, it always starts in the mind. You let go of something that's emotionally troubling you and the physical body will manifest this. I see this in my cancer patients. My team sees it as well. The moment they decide to forgive, the moment they decide to make peace with something or let go of anger, their bodies visibly change. Their blood work changes. Everything changes because we're all connected. Trillions of cells are dependent on our thoughts, which create emotions which create feelings which create our behavior and which create our experience of life so that's it about letting go you must practice and every time you find yourself resisting something ask okay and i want you to try this it's a beautiful thing okay human nature we resist and then immediately say what if i go with the flow with this one and i can guarantee you that's going to be beautiful for you it's going to be beautiful make an informed decision some things you've got to keep in control, like I said, self-control, certain processes, procedures, SOPs, but everything else, you're constantly resisting this person in your team. Maybe one day decide that I'm not going to resist anymore and see what happens. It could be beautiful. The same thing in your partner. There's something that you've been trying to change in your partner, back off completely, completely, and see how that changes. Let the universe unfold the way it's supposed to. Let nature do its own job. I'll end this with, with a beautiful thing. About seven and a half years ago, I used to visit different villages. When I was studying cancer, I would volunteer with different uh, NGOs and stuff like that. And in these villages, people didn't have money for any treatment. So an NGO would take them for the first cycle of chemo, second, and eventually a lot of patients would just never come back. Okay, because they were like, how am I gonna like, you know, the NGO is gonna give me six cycles. How am I gonna manage the rest? How am I gonna do anything else? Eight months later, when I went back to this village to meet people, you know, a lot of them had not even, they took the first cycle and no treatment after that. And when they were getting screened at the camp, you won't believe the amount of people who were actually fine. Their bodies had learned to live with the cancer. If there was a fibroid or a cyst or something, it had disappeared. What worked? Nature. There was no interference. This story isn't for you to dump your treatments and not do it, but it's an example to show you that sometimes... Don't go and throw your body into the world of allopathy and Ayurveda and homeopathy and think that's the only thing that can fix you. It can play a role, but there's also the intelligence within you, which if you allow nature to take its own course, it will heal you. It will help you recover. Now, if you're a gunshot victim or someone stabs you today, don't be waiting for nature to heal you. You get yourself to the ER immediately. Sensible decisions. Remember, intelligence when it comes to letting go. Intelligence when it comes to choosing where I should swim against the tide or whether I should go with the flow. Only you can make that decision. But it's beautiful sometimes to just sit back and let life flow. But you have to do the work, plant the seeds. I tell everyone I meet every single day, what seeds are you planting today? In your relationships, in your work, in yourself. Plant those seeds and just let them be. I know there are seeds which I've planted years ago, today, which have come up in such a huge way in my life. If I had not planted them, it wouldn't happen. So we never stop planting seeds at all. What are these seeds? What are these seeds that I'm talking about? A kind word to someone is a seed that leaves an imprint in their heart and mind. Tomorrow, that person may help you when you need it the most. Things that you say to your children, the things your children see you do, these are little seeds that you create through your behavior, your words, your actions, your gestures. When you do this from your heart, without expectation, you invest in your people. Tomorrow, they're going to be assets. You don't invest in them. You try to squeeze work out of them, all of that stuff. They're going to become liabilities at some time. Or they'll be assets, but they'll go to someone else. At every point in your life, you have the opportunity to plant seeds. Today, you decide that I'm going to study for 15 minutes every day. You're planting seeds. <clears throat> but if you say, oh, what's the point of start planting? Or what's the point of studying 15 minutes? What's going to happen? Okay. But you plant little seeds in yourself to mature, to evolve. All of these little things. Nothing is useless in life when it comes to learning. Is today, if you're in a situation, oh, this is a useful, useless situation. But go through it. Don't resist it. You're in the situation. Go through it. There may be little things that you can plant that may actually grow into something really strong at some point in your life. 
So this is about letting go. Before I end, there's one more very important. Every human being has a choice. Today, everyone wants to control. Everyone wants to be someone. And that's absolutely fine. Everyone does. Everyone wants to reach the top. Remember, the tallest trees catch the most wind. And when they catch the, more, the most wind, they have to be strong at a root level. They can be swayed a couple of branches. They're more susceptible to lightning striking them because they're the tallest tree in that particular area and all of that stuff. Aim to be at the top if you want to, but it comes with responsibility. It comes with learning what to let go of. You can't reach the top and have weights pulling you down because my past is still pulling me down. This emotional baggage is pulling me down. This relationship is pulling me down. You won't ever reach the top. You take one step up and then your weight of the past is pulling you. Your inability to let go, your inability to forgive is not letting you move up. And as human beings, we are meant to evolve. The only reasons we don't evolve is because of our own limitations that we put in our own selves. Have a great evening, everyone. Thank you for joining into the session. Do your homework. Very, very important. Very, very important. And if you already started off by saying, I can't let go, you've lost the battle. I want to let go. And now you start your journey.